get some information, but uh, I'm, I'm just starting the planning. Though. Where are you? Good afternoon. 
Welcome to the Durham Planning Commission. The members of the Durham Planning Commission have been appointed by the City Council and the County Board of Commissioners as an advisory board to the elected officials. You should know that the elected officials had a final say on any issue brought for us tonight. If you wish to speak on the agenda item, please go to the table to my left and sign up to speak. For those who wish to speak, please state your name, state your address clearly when, come, when you come to the podium. Please speak clearly into the microphone. Each side, those wishing to speak in favor of an item and those wishing to speak in opposition to an item will have 10 minutes to present each side. The time will be divided amongst all persons wishing to speak. If you are here rezoning, if you are here opposing the rezoning tonight, you should be aware of what's called a protest petition. A protest petition can be helpful to those residents who live in a rezoning area. Please consult the planning department staff for any details on a protest petition. They would be happy to help you. You should also keep in constant touch with the planning department as to when your case will go before the elected officials for a final vote. Finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative, so if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. Thank you. Can we have a roll call? Commissioner Beeland? Present. Commissioner Board? Present. Commissioner Davis? Present. Commissioner Gibbs? Present. Vice Chair Harris? Present. Chair Jones? Present. Commissioner Huff? Here. Commissioner Lamb? Here. Commissioner Padgett? Commissioner Smusky? Here. Commissioner Walters? Here. Commissioner Whitley? Here. Commissioner Winders? Here. All right, thank you. I did receive an email from Commissioner Pageant asking for an excused absence tonight, and I granted that to him. Do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the Commission, Pat Young with the Planning Department. I, I do have several requested adjustments, but first I can certify for the record that all public hearing items before you tonight have been advertised in accordance with the requirements of law and their affidavits to that effect on file with the Planning Department. Um, the first requested adjustment is uh, item five, uh, resolution in honor of Commissioner Barbara Beachwood. Ms. Beachwood was unable to be here this evening, so we'll ask that that be deferred to the March 11th meeting. Um, also on item 9A, the downtown open space plan, uh, there were several recent edits based on some citizen input, and we are going to ask also that that item be deferred to March 11th. So those two items will come off this evening's agenda. Um, item 6A and item 8A are essentially companion items. They're, they're related uh, subject matter. So we are going to also ask that item 6A be moved to 8A and that 8A become 8B so that it can be held. Um, concurrently, or in succession, excuse me. Uh, and that's it. Any questions or concerns about those? Uh, no, thank you, sir. Great, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I just wanted to make a suggestion. It seems like there are a lot of uh, community people for item, uh, I guess now 8A and 8B it would be probably best interest for them, if I'm correct, if we move that to 6A and 6B, if we could do that. We can do that. Okay, thank you. Can we have approval of the minutes? Move approval of the minutes. Second. It's been seconded by Commissioner Harris. All those in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. Minutes are approved 12 to zero. All right, thank you. So we'll move down to 6A, open the public hearing for 6A, which is the uh, village at Rougemont. Good evening, I'm Laura Woods. I'll be presenting case A, 13-0009, Village of Rougemont. And La this Laura, before you get started, I'm, I'm very sorry, Mr. Chair. 
I apologize, I know this is a bit irregular, but I had I promised staff, um, we have a staff member that's gonna be presenting to you in the coming months and uh, has to leave this evening, uh, and I wanted to very quickly turn it over to Erin Kane to introduce her, it'll be very brief. I apologize. Hey, members of the Planning Commission, uh, my name is Erin Kane, I'm with the uh, Durham City County Planning Department. I just wanted to introduce our newest staff member. Come on up. <laughs> Uh, this is Carla Rosenberg. She just joined us back in December. Uh, Carla is a native of Durham, uh, was born and raised here, went to Riverside High School as a graduate of UNC and their planning and social work programs. Um, and also has a certificate in historic preservation from UNC Greensboro. She's primarily going to be working on plan amendments going forward as well as historic preservation items. So uh, where you've seen uh, Ms. Woods and Hannah Jacobson in the past, you'll be seeing uh, Carla more going forward. So I just wanted to introduce her. You'll see her in her first case next month. And uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you. You may proceed. Okay, case A13-00009, Village of Rougemont. The Village of Rougemont is located in northern Durham County and the proposal is for approximately 576 acres. The area is located within the rural tier. In this case, the applicant is the County of Durham and it's initiated in order to fulfill policies that are adopted in the Durham Comprehensive Plan. The plan was adopted by County Commission in 2005. The village of Rougemont was designated on the future land use map at that time. That was February 2005. And the plan amendment is based upon the following comprehensive plan policies. One. Rural service centers establish rural service centers in the rural tier to provide locations for small scale commercial uses and community services. Rural village plans. The planning department is charged with developing land use plans and design guidelines to promote the continued economic viability as well as protect the character of the rural villages of Bahama and Rougemont. In this case, we're considering Rougemont. Rural Village Design Guidelines backs up the previous policy. Uh, the department is charged with developing design guidelines to protect, again, the character of our rural villages, Bahama and Rougemont, by encouraging appropriate and compatible infill and development. Historical Rural Villages. The planning department was asked to investigate the feasibility of establishment of a local or National Hist Register Historic District in Bahama and Rougemont. Staff did a preliminary survey of Rougemont and determined that a historic district probably isn't feasible. What's more, once we got into the community outreach effort for this project, and I'll talk about that more in a moment, we determined that there wasn't an enormous amount of support for trying to establish a historic district in Rougemont. Okay, the timing of the plan amendment, I've um, had a number of questions on this. You, you're probably aware that Durham County initiated a project to provide clean drinking water to some properties that have uh, groundwater contamination in Rougemont. And because of that, uh, the Joint City County Planning Committee uh, added the Rougemont plan to uh, our work program and ask us to kind of track our project with the water project. As far as I know, it is on course at this point. Now then, the proposal includes reconfiguring land that is designated commercial in Rougemont as you may see on the, the maps in the staff report, the commercial is a linear strip along Red Mountain Road. Uh, it probably doesn't um, provide viable commercial locations for uh, uses for, uh, locations for commercial uses. Um, after all, the area has been zoned 
uh, for commercial along Red Mountain Road for many decades. So as a matter of fact, I believe this zoning de designation dates back to the 1950s when Durham County first adopted a zoning ordinance. So staff recommends a somewhat of a reconfiguration in support of that policy we talked about, uh, uh, establishing a rural service center. Second, in order to provide for the rural, well, we've already discussed that, the um, proposal would gather the commercial in a sort of node in the vicinity of US Highway 501 and Red Mountain Road. And land not designated commercial in Richmond staff recommends that it be designated as very low density residential. This is consistent with the current development pattern within the village of Rougemont. And it's a pattern that has been there for many years and probably will pertain for our lifetimes. Well, some of the older among us. All right, I mentioned community involvement. Uh, staff conducted some pretty robust community involvement. We had six community meetings from May 2012 to February 2013. And we asked residents or attendees at the meetings to provide feedback and um, share their concerns. At the initial meeting, one of the first things we asked was, well, what is Rougemont to you? And what are the issues that most concern you and you would like us to address? The meeting was quite well attended. We were able to divide the attendees into nine groups and they all got to sketch what they imagined was Rougemont. As you see from the rather large pink area, there was a great deal of variation. So what stiff staff did was overlay each team's definition of Rougemont to identify the areas of the area of greatest overlap as it happened it very closely coincided with the existing village of Rougemont. And so we opted not to propose radical changes in the boundary as on the adopted uh, future land use map. Now, attendees, after identifying a series of issues, were asked to vote on what they thought was most important. And each was given three votes, which they could allocate in any fashion they wished the most popular of the uh, issues was provision of water. Uh, at that time, the discussion was uh, a water line from Person County. That project has changed, but as you see, contaminated groundwater was the primary issue in Rougemont. Second, identify an appropriate location for a park and ride bus facility that would connect Rougemont to Durham and therefore to the region. Third most um, important, attract commercial development. Fourth, investigate the feasibility of a historic district. We did that, probably a no-go. Finally, re-examine future land use and zoning map designations. Now, you will note tonight that I'm only um, offering a plan amendment. It changes the future land use map. There is no associated zoning map change. We did not deem it prudent at this time to recommend zoning map changes. The future land use map, to remind you, primarily serves the function as a policy guide when a landowner approaches the county and applies to rezone their property. Staff planning commission, the elected bodies, one of the criteria is that the zoning request be consistent with the future land use map. Otherwise, future land use map plays very little role in the lives of property owners. If you like your zoning now, then whatever that zoning allows will be allowed by right in the future as long as that zoning pertains. Okay, here's the village and it's approximately 576 acres. Once you subtract all the rights of way, it's actually a bit under 500. And not all properties within this area have, for, we have not 
proposed changes to the future land use for all of the properties. Actually, it's a little over 53%. And of those, many are because the properties are actually split by different land use categories. And so our proposal is to make entire properties one future land use, not split them. The classic example, of course, is along Red Mountain Road where the future land use sometimes divides property with the part fronting Red Mountain Road being commercial and the back part of the lot being rural residential. Also, a few properties we are suggesting as adding to the village of Rougemont, and the reason, primary reason for that is that with the 2005 boundary, here shown in purple, as you see, there were many properties that were split by that boundary. So staff opted to push the boundary out just a little bit to incorporate the entire property. In two cases, on the north side of the boundary, you'll note that there are two long linear, uh, long streets with cul-de-sacs. And in that, those cases, some of the lots were included in the village in 05, some are outside. We opted to move the boundary outward to include all the properties on the streets. That accounts, in large measure, for any change to the Rougemont boundary that we are proposing. Okay, here is the commercial, the much discussed commercial future land use in Rougemont, as you see, a long linear strip along Red Mountain Road. In order to provide for an opportunity for an actual rural service center, we suggest moving that to the vicinity of the intersection of Highway 501 and Red Mountain Road. Again, this does not propose changing anyone's zoning. If, for example, there are residences within that area in red, they can continue to be residential and their zoning will not change. It is strictly up to the private landowner to decide whether they wish to utilize this or not. Government is not involved unless you apply to rezone your land. Now, for the rest of the properties within Rougemont, uh, here is the 05 um, map as adopted by County Commission, and you'll see that most of the rest of the land is very low density residential with a bit of rural density residential scattered in. We suggest simply making the re all of the residential land within Rougemont very low density residential. And the text amendment associated with this apply has some pretty important applications to residential land, but we'll talk about that when we get to that case. Now then, what are the criteria for plan amendments? The four questions. Is the proposed land use consistent with adopted plans and policies? Is the proposed land use compatible with existing and or future land use patterns? Does the proposed land use create a substantial adverse impact? And is the site of adequate size and shape to accommodate the proposed land uses? In each case, staff has concluded that the proposed land use is consistent, it is compatible, it does not create adverse impacts, and it is of adequate shape and size to accommodate the proposed uses. Therefore, staff recommends approval. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. We have two people signed up to speak. Does anyone else sign up with just the two? It's uh, Don Mason and uh, Joe Honing. Okay. Uh, v2 individuals, one for and one against. So each side would have 10 minutes each. So we have uh, Mr. Don Mason. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Don Mason, and I reside and live at Rougemont. I, I live on the golf course Lake Winds, which I built in the 80s. And as time went on, I developed 
some sections because I built the golf course with priority and uh, I'm left with some parcels of land that need, the golf course needs badly to have homes uh, in and around it. As you know, golf courses usually draws that situation. But here's a different one. If you look at page two on my sheet in front of you, you'll note the, all the conservation lands to the south and all surround the whole area, which will never be any building. And Lake Winds needs to be finished as per approved in the late 80s. And then there was stages and phases, allocation for, for the uh, utilities and all was limited to 15 lots in that time frame. So then we had changes over time and I kept working two, two jobs, doing everything on the course and doing that. So now we still are left with the need to get back to the original approved plan of one acre per uh, the same as the Rougemont Village plan. And if you'll note, we bump right up to it. And this is my, rec my plea is to r ask you to consider the Planning Commission to allow this to be taken in to this one acre issue. The three acre UDO at present has stopped us in our tracks and we cannot complete as it is because already in place the roads were cut. Earlier when I built the golf course to use the soils on the tees and the greens. Common sense, I was lucky to even get it done. It was a calling a labor of love. But then the utilities are underneath the ground to get to the lake. Already everything, infrastructure is in place. So the three acre, if you look at page three, you will notice the roads are pre-cut. On the one on the right, you can see the aerial. And in getting the perks, you can't get a perk to change because the soil has been already cut out. So we are in jeopardy in every way. The golf course needs the support of more members and uh, it's a treasure in Northern Durham County, if you know that. And we want it to be successful. And it is, a. if you'll notice, we are bumped right up to the village and that, that would include, that section should be added to it and that way it would answer the future and it could be continued and finished out because I had to build it in stages. I'm a custodian, not a developer. I lived there and I have all these years and continued. And you can see from the last pages uh, that my request should be examined and it would be well uh, to have us included. And another thing I have a vision as I did with a golf course is to have a park on 501 on page two, you'll notice the Rouge, I'm proposing to give the land to the Rougemont Ruiton Club on that parcel that you see on the map. A great building site, if included in this plan, it would, the impervious surface all the requirements needed would be right for that parcel. And the park that would be involved would be perfectly fitting in with the railroad tracks when the future trails happen if the county ever acquires the railroad track. So I would ask you to please consider my needs <clears throat> and the community needs and uh, we would certainly hope I've given you enough of evidence. It's not feasible under the three acre UDO, but it would be perfect fit with the Rougemont Village plan. And therefore I ask you to consider this being included and amend the plan to include as per the map on page one. And it's R20, R20 zoning and it would encompass the remaining track that is, needs to be completed. And that's all I have to ask for at this time, and if you would consider that, 
there's any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. All right, thank you. If we need thank you, we'll call you back up. Thank you very much. Okay. And, okay, we have, uh, how to pronounce your name again, sir? Han. Han, yes, okay. Mr. Joe Han. My name is Joseph Hahn. I'm 404 Shetland Road in Rougemont. I've been a resident there for 25 years. Um, been kind of a leader in the community, very active in the Rortan Club. And um, although I feel this plan has some real merits, I also feel it has some deficiencies. And so the reason I'm against it tonight is because I think we need a delay to talk about a few things a little bit longer. Um, I'd like to give you just a little history. Um, originally, the area up there developed around a mill called, I believe it was Bowling's Mill. Uh, Linda happens to live right close, uh, like within a stone's throw of where Bowling's Mill existed. And the, the village grew up around Bowling's Mill towards Moore's Mill. Uh, that was all fine and good until the late 1800s. Uh, when they decided to put a railroad through there. Um, at that time, I don't, it, the town had gone through, or the village had gone through different names, but it eventually settled on the name Rougemont, not because of the residents wanted it, but the, super, the railroad superintendent's wife was a French aficionado, and she figured, well, there's Red Mountain there, so why not name the village Rougemont? So everything, of course, grew up along the railroad. So the adopted future use plan that you see on the top, the existing one, obviously uh, reflects the fact that the commercial district grew up close to the railroad. There were barber shops, um, there's a school, uh, uh, there were uh, 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 all kinds of uh, various stores, gas stations, you name it. And so that kind of became the commercial district. And that was all fine and good until in the 1960s when Telephone came out to Rougemont. And later on when uh, they widened 501 to four lanes, uh, it made quite a bit of difference uh, in the traffic. And in the 25 years I've lived out there, if any of you know, and that's one of the reasons why they're looking at a park and ride, Half of the vehicles coming down through Rougemont in the morning have Virginia license plates. They're heading to the park, they're heading to Duke, they're heading for centers of employment, which makes sense. So this plan makes more sense because it's developing, it's changing the potential for commercial development from along Red Mountain Road, which is a residential road basically, to a US highway, US 501. Um, the major problem with the commercial district as defined on your map here is most of those properties were um, platted and developed prior to any zoning in the county. And anybody that knows anything about the Rougemont area knows that there is a vast amount of property out there that does not perk. And I would venture to say that probably half of the property that's in this designated commercial district uh, will not perk. So it's not suitable for commercial development the way it exists. Uh, it, I mean, you can, you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. And um, so part of my concern is that the commercial district is not big enough and there's an an obvious area that should be designated commercial that's not here. And that's the area that goes south on the east side of 501. If you go down that south side, and you've got a map that looks like this, I believe, in, in your packet. If you go down that south side, right now the village ends here. But all of this property down through here except for one area, is undeveloped. It's larger, it has uh, larger areas uh, that can perk. 
It's more readily developable for commercial purposes uh, and makes more sense. And the terminating property is already rezoned industrial. It's the only piece of property in the northern part of Durham in Mangum Township that I know of, well, excuse me, outside of Trayburn, um, that uh, is zoned industrial. So it may, would make a lot more sense to designate this strip on the east side of 501 as in the f future land use plan as commercial. Part of it is self-interest. Um, as Don Mason already stated, um, Don is willing to, uh, to donate to the Rougemont Ruritan Club a piece of property that we would like to develop um, into uh, our clubhouse and also a community park. And that piece of property looks like it's this eastern part of that piece of property. Again, there's your railroad tracks, there's 501. Um, it's all in that area that would be future commercial, so it could fit in there without any trouble. Um, have have a, a greater potential for some, um, some density um, and we'd very much like to do that. For those of you who know the Rougemont Ruritan Club, it was founded in 1950. In 1953, they built a log cabin, which is their meeting place. All hand-hewn logs, all from the area, none treated. Been there 50-some, or 60-some years. Um, the place is, needs a lot of work. And we're on property that if it burns down, we can't rebuild because of the density limitations. We have two pieces of land and they total a grand total, I think, of 1.7 acres. And so we're looking at the possibility of moving the Ruritan, and this is our potential for doing that. Um, those of you who know the Rougemont Ruritan know what they do for the community. If you drive up at Christmas time, everybody sees the Christmas angels. They exist because of the Ruritan. The flags fly because of that. Wouldn't have the green box out there if the Ruritan wouldn't have fought for it. We wouldn't have the traffic light if the Ruritan wouldn't have fought for it. We do a lot for the community. We're community oriented. We raise money through fundraisers and every dime we raise every year goes back into the community. Unlike most uh, civic groups uh, that have some sort of national project, Ruritans are local. They serve only the community that they're in. Our treasurer is here tonight, and he can tell you that we spend every time. <laughs> and, uh, and so I would ask you to, to delay this so we can talk about it a little bit more and to make sure that accommodations could be made uh, for extending that commercial area uh, so that we can get some commercial out there with a reasonable possibility that it can be sited someplace that'll perk. And, and also the, so that we can develop the Ruritan and the community park. And I thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Do we have anyone else here wishing to speak on this item? No? Okay, we'll close the uh, public hearing and we'll bring it back before the commissioners. Do we have anyone that has any questions? Uh, Reverend Whitley. Ms. Woods, <clears throat> was there any consideration about widening the commercial area to consider the property that he referred to? Um, the vast majority of attendees at the meetings expressed no preference to enlarge the village of Rougemont. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lamb. Yeah, thank you. I just uh, a point of clarification. Um, do I understand you correctly to be saying that the property that the Rortan Club seeks eventually to develop for commercial purposes is outside of the designated commercial district that the city's proposal recommends? And is it? Oh. I, I, 
You can come back up to the uh, yeah, could, podium. Pardon me, uh, may I correct one important misstatement? Yes. We're, this is a county case, not city. Okay, the county, my apologies. <laughs> it comes within two properties. Okay. So it's two properties away from the proposed Flume uh, commercial district. Okay. And uh, was the Ruritan Club involved in the process of um, designating or, or um, the, the public process that the, that the staff uh, mentioned? Uh, we were not actively involved because we have been actively involved in the water situation. Okay. We've been taking the point on the water situation, and, um, and because of that, we hope to ha actually have the, that resolved by January of 2016. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Board, then Huff. Hello. Follow-up question for staff. Um, you said that the people who did attend your public meetings were not interested in extending the borders to the south but was there any opposition to doing so? I do not recall any specific opposition. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, I attended all of the meetings, I think maybe but uh, one. And um, something that I'd like to say about the decision-making process, it's, it's very confusing to just to people who are, who are not familiar with planning terms, with future land use map, with zoning. It's, it, it took a lot of Laura's um, energy, in fact, to inform people of exactly what was happening. Um, I think the reason that uh, the commercial, that, that no one pushed harder for a commercial district along 501 is that I mean, I certainly mm -hmm. thought that there would be there would be a presentation, and people would say, "Well, look, we're leaving this we're leaving this land out. We're leaving we're, we're this obvious area where, in fact, there's already a zoning for industrial. Um, it's an obvious area for commercial development, and and I think that I, I think that this hasn't been thought through." carefully enough, to be honest with you. I, and, and I think that there's been an enormous effort to, to think it through. But it's a complicated issue, and, and it involves a community of people understanding exactly what's going on. So, um, you know, it always, when I was on the Planning Commission before, the kinds of cases that came before us that were the most distressing were ones in which people had had started a development and the zoning changed unbeknownst to them and or or we were voting to zone out what they had been paying taxes on and we have a situation here where where a development was started it was started and it's in phases and and I think we we have a responsibility as a community to think about whether or not that development can go forward there's been considerable effort put into it so those are my comments. Mr. Chair, might I address some of, some of these concerns? Um, Pat Young again with the planning department. The um, club or lodge that was referred to by the speakers um, could be developed under the current zoning on the property in question. The application of the future land use designation for the village would really have no impact on that either way. There would still be a use permit required because it's a a non-residential use in a residential zoning district, mm -hmm. but that could proceed uh, independently. Now, in terms of the broader issues about additional commercial uses, we certainly understand. I think all I could say to that is there were, there were six community meetings over a, a year and a half. Is that right, Laura? Um, I mean, we, we did our best to try to get input, and uh, we are where we are. We, we certainly don't want to... Uh, I, I will say one last thing. The comp plan, as I think you all are aware, um, requires us to be recommending and encouraging through the future land use map nodal development meaning development centered on um, roadway intersections better access better infrastructure support um, there does become a point if you extend this thing that it becomes more like strip development which is really what we're 
trying to get away from, and that would have to be you know, carefully evaluated. There might be a need to take properties out of the northern side. I can't say that for sure until we look at it more closely, but um, I just want to put it on the table that it's, it's not a, a real simple, uh, quick hit. It would have to probably be pretty thoroughly evaluated. Um, and I, those were just some comments. I'd be happy to take any follow-up questions. Were you finished? Were you get out? Miss Huff. I think people would like to know how easy it would be to uh, change the um, thing we have before us tonight. I think that that's a concern. You know, how set in stone? Uh, in order to make that sort of substantive change, then it would probably be necessary to schedule additional community meetings, go through another process. I suspect, <laughs> given my experience, with this project so far, it would sow considerable confusion in the community and perhaps suspicion in some cases. I'm not saying um, it's a bad thing. I'm saying that the change would be more complicated than you may imagine. If I, if I might add to that too, I, I think we obviously always want to con consider and contemplate any, any serious concerns, and this is one. But, it, and you've heard this as a recurring theme over the last uh, year especially, that at some point it becomes a resource allocation issue. We've got a very small number of staff, um, Laura being one, that work on a large number of strategic planning projects for the community that are, that are all priorities. And uh, I think the time and effort we've spent out in Rougemont has been considerable. And I think I, I, I'm certainly not authorized um, without consultation with the planning director to, to take it back out for additional evaluation. I, my recommendation is that we no, certainly note this concern, thoroughly uh, vet it and daylight it when it goes forward, but, uh, and then if, of course if we're directed by the elected officials, the planning director will have to make a determination there, but, and you all can certainly make whatever recommendation you want, but we can't, we can't commit to, to additional input or evaluation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just backing up, it, it's important to remember that the Board of County Commissioners when this goes to public hearing, can instruct staff to change the map without the additional community meetings. Or, uh, that's their prerogative as elected officials. Ms. Walters, did, so we're gonna finish everyone and if you have an additional question, we'll come back to you, Ms. Hoff. Ms. yes. I wanted to ask about the two outlying commercial parcels shown in the proposed. Yes. Can you talk about those? Yes. Thank um, you. Are you referring to the ones on the east? Mm -hmm. Okay. And the north. Yeah, there yeah. are two. All right. And then the, the one particularly in the, the split zoned one. Yeah, yeah, I forgot to mention that and I was going to mention those outliers because they're rather odd looking. The one on the north is an existing convenience store. It's been there for many years. Chances are it's going to be there for a while and they have the zoning, so we just left them alone. On the south side of Red Mountain Road, to the east, there's a rather large, almost square parcel. That's an existing small shopping center. It's minimally occupied at the moment, but it is the shopping center. And the large area east of that, on the north side of Red Mountain Road, is a large, large animal veterinarian. They currently have the commercial zoning. Chances are they're going to remain there for the foreseeable future. So we just simply left that as the commercial. I beg your pardon. Yes, it, the property is split. That is one of the few cases on the map where we actually recommend that the back be designated as um, very low density residential. Now, in point of fact, although it's not zoned residential, they are allowed to use that area in the back. That's, that's where they keep the horses and, and allow them to, to roam free, as it were. And uh, the change in land use will, will not affect it at all. It, it's currently designated rural density residential. So. Commissioner Harris. Speaking about confusion, I attended a number of those meetings too, and I know the first meetings that were held, people were there thinking that they were gonna get a resolution for the water situation and not 
the future land use map of Rujamal. So, I mean, it was confusion even from the start of it as far as the real purpose of those meetings because people thought that you were working on the, the, the water situation, you know. Uh, so, uh, I would be in favor of at least consideration of, uh, you know, maybe doing some misogynal changes to this. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, well, I'm not sure that an, an answer is required, but yeah, I sense the confusion as well and worked very hard to separate the two projects. The timing of the two projects was purely a matter of issues having nothing to do with planning concerning the timing of the water project and planning department directed to undertake this process at this time by our work program, which was approved by the Joint City County Planning Committee. So we had very little, we had very little wiggle room in terms of our timing for our project as opposed to the water project. All right, thank you. Okay. Next, um, I'm gonna get Dr. Winders and Mr. Smusky, then I'm gonna come back to you two. I'd like to ask um, uh, about the, uh, the difference between the zoning and the, and the, and the plan. Uh, uh, Pat, I believe you said that the, the current zoning would allow the Ruritan um, project that, uh, but the, um, what about the development around the golf course? Uh, The development around the golf course is not included in this in this proposal. It's not part of the uh, of this. That is this correct. It is to the southeast of the village of Richmond. So that's a whole different issue. Precisely, it is. Its uh, zoning is controlled by the zoning ordinance and the watershed overlay protection ordinance and. You know that applies to that particular watershed which by the way is Lake Mickey Little River protected area or, or B they call it. It, it Lake Winds is not a part of our proposal Mr. Mason who spoke earlier would like it to be a part of the proposal so we we haven't considered Lake Winds because it isn't yeah I, I'm not really clear on where it is on the map that we have in our packet. <laughs> and, um, oh, well, this is easy to solve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the map. I remember seeing yeah. a golf course. The map there. in the, you may recall, the, the map that I showed you at the beginning of my presentation. Um, the, yes, the, yeah, I will walk over. Yes, of course. <laughs> Um, yes, actually, Lake, Lake Winds is the area precisely under the county-wide map that indicates the lo general location of Richmond. It's underneath that map. You can see a few of the lots just on the uh, western boundary of the inset map. Mm -hmm. That's the, the, and the golf course is in the green, is on the map that we have in the packet it's yeah. uh, there's the uh, recreation open space that's the golf course that is correct yeah and then the yeah so um and it's not uh you it was part of this project or it's relevant to this project but it just was not you decided or the the community decided and the planning department decided that it should not be included in the village of, of Rougemont. The village of Rougemont, as defined in the 2005 comprehensive plan, did not include Lake Winds. We did not include Lake Winds 
based upon the team exercise that I discussed where the different teams sketched Ridgemont and we sort of overlaid them to get a best fit, we opted not to, in other words, expand greatly the village of Rougemont boundary for the precise purpose of protecting a water supply watershed. Keep in mind there is a text amendment coming up. There are aspects of that proposal that change what one can do within the village of Rougemont. Now the village of Rougemont is approximately 2% of the total protective watershed. If you're doubling the size, then you're doubling the impact of what we're proposing with the text amendment that you will be hearing shortly. It would still be possible to rezone the area uh, on the other side of the golf, golf course. Uh, Mr. Mason or, or any landowner is free to apply for a plan amendment to change the land use policies of the county, he is also free to apply for a rezoning. That's true for any landowner yes, in Durham County. Yes. Finish. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smusky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so. Ms. Woods, if I, if I remember correctly, you said that this future land use map did not change the zoning. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, so um, on this map going down Red, uh, Red Mountain Road, all those, are, are all those properties in red currently zoned commercial? The future land use map as currently adopted simply reflects the existing zoning and all of those properties are in at least the front part of the properties in some cases are zoned commercial. Therefore, the owners of those properties would, if they cho chose to do so, add, if they wanted to start a commercial ent enterprise, they have the zoning to allow that, despite what the future land use map may say. And so they would have to apply for a rezoning if they wanted to put in a house, a residential? They, most of those, uh, most, if, 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 there's no pro if there's no house on it now, yes. Most of those properties actually do have residences on them and they've been there for many years. Okay, so if, if we lay this out as a plan, you know, we've, we've come under some criticism for having plans that we change. But as pointed out, there are some uh, other properties that are not going to be incorporated into this plan, but could logically in the future be seen um, to be compatible with commercial zoning. Mm -hmm. Is that, that would be correct statement, it, right? It's, it, is poss it is possible. Okay, so we, we could see the zoning progress out from this current central. Um, yes, but that's ultimately a private landowner decision whether they wish to apply for a rezoning. Right, okay. And in some cases, a plan amendment as well. Right. And so uh, for Mr. Mason's property and that project that, that was going on, um, even though it's not included in this future land use map or, or the plan that could be considered at another time. They could, the county commissioners could consider that project for relief, right? There are, yeah, multiple things could happen. We're talking hypotheticals here, yes. At when this particular proposal goes to Board of County Commissioners, they could uh, instruct staff to change the map or they could consider another project at some later date, which planning would undertake, or the landowner could at any time, if they consider it worthwhile, apply for a rezoning and a plan amendment. I, I wasn't trying to discuss hypotheticals. I was trying to find avenues of relief. Okay. And, and so I, I think we've we found out that even if this plan moves forward from us, that it can be changed by the elected officials, 
It could. Um, in future considerations, even if they adopt it as such, it could be changed by the inquiries of uh, the individual landowners and specific proje projects that come up, right? It would be unusual to do so, but account the county could initiate a plan amendment on its own at some point. I mean, they initiated this plan amendment. Uh, okay, so, but, but the landowners could initiate a plan amendment, a request for a plan amendment. They could. And then, and then there is the other, like you said, rare possibility that the county commissioners could proceed to provide um, relief for this. But, but that, that would be rare. So there are avenues for relief and, and, and future consideration of, of these properties that are in question. Potentially. Potentially. That, that's what I wanted to discuss. Thank you, sir. And ma'am. All right, so we'll go back to Commissioner Board and Huff. Yes. Okay. All right. I think we're all kind of on the same page here, but I'm trying to figure out what motion we need to make to move this forward. In my mind, it appears that within the, the plan that you have is basically within the existing boundaries of Rougemont with some minor changes at the edges and mostly it's drawing the commercial center into the middle. And to me that makes sense and it seems like a good thing. We also have this citizen concern that the area further down 15501 also be changed. So my question is from the planning department's point of view, would it make more sense to incorporate that plan as part of this, and we could consider that in our motion to suggest to the county that they could modify this, or would it make more sense to initiate it as a separate change? Planning staff is in no position to change the proposal at this point. Um, as my understanding of planning commission, of, you, of your role, you can make what recommendation suits the planning commission. Well, there's what suit us, suits us and what makes practical sense. <laughs> this is staff's proposal. Okay. And assuming it goes forward, it will go to, this is the form it will take at Board of County Commissioners. Okay. Ms. Hoff. Um, just explain what happens if it doesn't go forward. So you all, under the UDO, the Planning Commission has the authority to defer item for up to three cycles or 90 days, but after that it, it would go forward under any scenario. I think your options are to recommend approval, recommend denial, or recommend approval with modifications. Um, and as Laura alluded to, right, I, I think kind of the bottom line is we tried our, our, our best, I, th I think we did a pretty good job of having a, a community consensus with the six meetings. And uh, essentially, any modifications to that from staff's perspective, I mean, you all certainly are free to make any recommendations you, you see fit. Um, certainly, Mr. what Mr. Hans presented tonight, this is the very first time we're, we're hearing of that. Uh, Mr. Mason has been in contact with us for at least several weeks, maybe longer. Um, but uh, we, we essentially feel like we owe it to the stakeholders that were involved in the participation process to not recommend any changes at this time. So, but we certainly respect your authority to do so. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Davis. Uh, if there's no more discussion, I recommend approval. Uh, we don't want to set a precedent for a handful of individuals to come and have a discrepancy on something that's been out for six to eight months. Um, if we start that, the next plan amendment that we have proposal, if myself miss six meetings and I come to this meeting and say, hey, wait, I'm an owner and I wasn't included, then we'll have to start a precedent. So being that said, um, I move approval of plan amendment um, A130009. Second. All right, I'm moving and properly second by Reverend Whitley. All those in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. All right, any opposition? Motion has passed, 12 to 1. All right, thank you. We'll move down to item 6B, which is the watershed protection overlay 
Rural Villages, TC 130003. Laura Woods, Planning Department, and this presentation will most likely be much briefer because the subject matter is uh, actually quite simpler. This is the regulatory component of the Village of Rougemont planning project. And we recommend some changes to the watershed regulations for the Lake Mickey Little River protected area. That would be M slash LR dash B. And our recommendation per the community meetings that we had in Rougemont is that within the village of Rougemont, the minimum lot size be allowed uh, down to one acre. Now, it's important to remember with this proposal, that does not mean that every landowner will be able to plat their properties at one acre lots. The overriding regulation for Durham County remains the septic system regulations in order to have a plat approved, you have to have a septic system permit. The soils in Rougemont are in many cases quite poor for septic systems. Therefore, not every property could be, pos could be developed at one acre lots. However, this does provide an opportunity for some small number, an indeterminate number of landowners to subdivide multi-acre parcels. And the genesis of this recommendation is that a number of persons pointed out that with the current three-acre lot minimum in that protected area, they are unable to divide, subdivide their property to provide additional residential lots for their, their children. The second recommendation concerning watershed rules is that within rural villages and specifically the rural villages within this protected watershed, Lake Mickey, Little River Overlay, and there's only one, Rougemont, the impervious surface limit be allowed to increase to 12%. It is currently 6%, which is pretty restrictive. And what we found in looking at a map is that there are residential properties that are already maxed out on their or close to maxed out on the impervious surface allowed, which means it's very difficult for a homeowner to improve their property by, for instance, adding an addition. The 12% allows them a great deal more flexibility, plus a 24% high density option as long as they incorporate approved engineered stormwater runoff controls. And Chances are most residential, most of the residential properties would not go the high density round. So, um, other than that, uh, uh, one other section 8.7.3 um, exceptions for existing single family lots. Currently, that regulation states that lots that were platted prior to January 1st, 1994 the regulations that pertain are the regulations that were in place at the time they platted their lot. We suggest a small change that within rural villages, as defined by the future land use map, such lots can utilize the current standards in effect, meaning the one acre and the impervious surface of which we previously discussed, or whichever regulation is least restrictive to the landowner. In other words, it provides the landowner more flexibility than landowners currently have in this protected area. And uh, other than adding a definition to the UDO for rural village, that in essence is the text amendment. That concludes my presentation. All right, thank you. I don't have anyone signed up for it. Is that the case? Scott? Pat? No. 
Okay. So we'll close the public hearing on that and bring it back before the commission. Do we have anyone signed up or wishing any questions? Can we get a motion? Mr. Chair, I move approval of tax amendment TC 1300003. Second. All right, moved and properly second. All those in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. Chair, before I give you the vote on that, I do need to make a correction on A1300009. That motion did pass 11 to 1. Okay. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yes. May I change my vote on that one and make it, make it 12 to 0? I'm not sure. Hold that thought for a minute. I don't think so. I'm afraid not. Yes. Okay. Yeah, maybe next time. I don't know. Um, okay, uh, so we were in the middle of this vote and we said all in favor, so any opposition? No. The vote has passed 12 to 0. All right, thank you. We'll move down to item 7A, which is Chapel Creek Z, 1300014. Good evening, Amy Wolf with the Planning Department. This is case Z1300014. The, um, Chapel Creek. The applicant is Eden's Land Corp. It is in the city's, it is it being considered under the city's jurisdiction because it is has a pending app, uh, annexation a, and will be considered as a consolidated land use item when it goes before city council. Uh, the request is from Residential Suburban 20, of, which is the current zoning designation, and the proposal is for the Planned Development Residential, or PDR, 8.000 designation. Uh, the 8.000 represents the, the proposed density of the site. A, the site is 17.10 acres, and the proposed use is for 105 residential acres. Again, it will be considered a consolidated land use item along with annexation and a utility extension agreement when it goes to council. And I would like to remind the Planning Commission that you did hear this item at the November Planning Commission. Uh, at the time, it did include a plan amendment. Uh, this uh, commission did recommend denial of both the plan amendment and zoning map change at that time. Since that time, the applicant amended this application um, from the, a lower density of 3.919 units per acre, which would allow 50 single family lots, to this request before you again, which is for eight units an acre, which would allow 105 residential units. This request is in the suburban tier in the suburban transit area. It is 28 parcels, has frontage along George King Road and Crossland Drive. It's in the north west quadrant of the Interstate 40 and NC 54 intersection. <coughs> Excuse me. It is in the FJB watershed protection overlay. A portion of the site, the site to the east, um, east of this dark line on the context map shown here, is in the major transportation corridor overlay. And it is also in the vicinity of Army Corps land, which is used for flood control purposes, which is located to the west and south of a portion of the site. This request does, <coughs> excuse me, satisfy the requirements of the planned development residential district. Um, the site is 17.1 acres. Uh, a little bit more than 13 of that is considered net acreage when you're considering developable area and the development plan reflects all the requirements. What you see here are the existing conditions of the site. George King Road is on the far left-hand side of this graphic. Uh, Crossland Drive enters uh, from the south as well as Ridgeway, <coughs> excuse me, Ridgeway Road. Again, it's 28 lots. There are streams through the site, one in the northwest portion of the site as well as a longer segment uh, running from the south to the north at, a, at an angle. 
There's also a gas line easement in the southwest corner of the site, and right now the site is primarily tree covered. The proposal <coughs> is shown here. It, rep it, it includes all the requirements of a development plan, um, and I'll go over the commitments in, in a moment. Uh, primarily what you see is very similar to the last plan. Um, this dashed line represents uh, the alignment or location of Southwest Durham Drive, which will be a continuation of Qu Crossland Drive. This plan also shows three phase areas. The, the plan you saw back in November had two phase areas, which, which is a requirement for any request in the suburban transit area. The first phase is um, on the west side of the larger stream segment, not to include the shaded area. Phase two is to the east of the stream segment, and then this shaded area represents phase three. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, commitments of the zone are maximum of 105 residential lots. That should say residential units. Um, uh, proposed two stream crossings, uh, four side access points, a maximum of 50% impervious surface, and 20% tree preservation. Graphic commitments are, include the, the location of those access points, location of the tree preservation area, the location of those phase areas, as well as the location of the multifamily development, <coughs> which it could only be accommodated in the phase three, because phase three uh, has a building and parking envelope, which is a requirement on the development plan for the potential for multifamily. It also, um, the access points are committed to be public street rights away. Tax amendments, <coughs> excuse me, tax commitments include that the use will be single and multifamily residential and, and accessory uses, the a minimum lot size for single family of 3,500 square feet. The previous plan showed 4,000 square foot minimum lot size for single family. Um, construction of the public collector street through the site, which is the uh, extension of Crossland Drive, but also the um, construction of Crossland Drive um, uh, presently uh, just off the site, uh, as well as construction of Ridgeway Road as a public street. This request is now consistent with the comprehensive plan and the, the, the future land use designated as medium high density residential of eight to 20 units an acre, um, which is the need, um, the, why the original plan amendment associated with this request has been administratively withdrawn because the density was increased to meet the future land use map projection. This request is consistent with all the policies of the comprehensive plan that apply to the site, and staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. All right, thank you. We have two people signed up to speak for and one against. Uh, Jared Edens, Lynn Scott for, and Chris Selby against. Good evening. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Jared Edens with Edens Land Corp. Here representing my client, uh, David Weekly Homes. I thought uh, Amy gave a very thorough summary of the project and uh, what we've revised with the, uh, the new application. I guess at first you don't succeed, try, try again. So we uh, left the last meeting uh, without enough density. Uh, took your feedback, took the feedback from staff. Uh, my client did some work on finding some different product options that would help increase the density on the site. So uh, what you have before you tonight is very similar plan-wise to what we had before, except we now, uh, we've more than doubled the density from the plan we had in November. Uh, we are consistent with the comp plan. And um, other than that, I'd be glad to have be, uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. All right, thank you. Lynn Scott. Good evening, I'm Lynn Scott, and I live at 211 Celeste Circle, which is in Eastwood Park. It is the neighborhood that borders this development. Um, I'm happy with the plan they've presented. As I was here um, at the earlier meeting, and my 
Um, concern is I'd love to see the neighborhood developed out residential as it was originally planned. The David Weekly looks to be um, very good builders. They do um, clean building, eco-friendly building, and I think that's a good statement for Durham. Thank you. All right, thank you. I have Mr. Chris Selby. Thank you. Uh, I'm Chris Selby. I live at 138 Celeste Circle, in, in, also in Eastwood Park. I've lived there since uh, 1997. And uh, by way of introduction, I'd like to note that uh, the NC54 I-40 corridor study recommends that the Celeste Circle neighborhood, that's our neighborhood, uh, remain residential through the 2035 horizon. The recommendation is consistent with the nodal development concept for the corridor. And as far as after 2035, it, our neighborhood, could in future be oriented toward transit rather than NC54 while remaining residential. So I'm very enthusiastic about the opportunity to live on the periphery of this Lee Village. I hope I live long enough to enjoy it and uh, rail, uh, light rail transit. <coughs> uh, and so I'm, I'm for transit-friendly development. This development uh, is, is very new to me. Uh, the developer kindly provided me with a, a sketch of the layout. I think it was yesterday. And uh, I'd say uh, I really haven't thought about it as much as I'd like. So right now I could only offer uh, modest support for the plan. I do, however, have a, a serious caveat to that. That's why I signed up against uh, otherwise I'm modestly for this plan uh, the there actually is a, a serious caveat and a, a very not serious one they both popped up when I was reading the technical report I, I assume that you all have the technical report I noted on page uh, 12 out of 14 there's an appendix F site conditions uh, table F site context and then it says existing uses and this is the area around the plot and to the south where we are it says vacant single family residential it, there's not a vacant house on, in our neighborhood that borders that so it seems to me like a mistake uh, vacant means vacant uh, unless there's some planning something or other that I'm not familiar with uh, and Relevant to that, uh, on page nine before that, there's a table D4 project boundary buffers, and we're on the boundary there. And the boundary to the south where we are, it says required opacity, zero of zero, and the, the proposed is not applicable. I don't know what that means, but I wonder if there would be a required opacity if we were not vacant. So that, it seems like some something about this report that I, doesn't seem right and I think should be addressed before this is approved, can be approved. The second, so that's the minor uh, point. The, the major one, they, it brought it up on page four first. Uh, it says, as far as area characteristics, the, now the characteristics are it's developed as single family to the south, that's us. And on the first page under the sur summary, it says the site is comprised of parcels with frontage on George King Road and Crossland Drive. And I got to looking at the map, and I'm glad there's a, there's a picture one I'd like to use it. Is there a way to get the map back up there to? Oh, there we go, thank you. Uh, here we go. So here's Crossland Drive. Uh, and, and also I'd like to point out, okay. And what struck me is that uh, it's going through Corps of Engineers land. The, the road, if you see where my pointer is, there's a stub out here. Uh, at the intersection of Celeste here and Crossland here. And the stub out is there and, and to, the proposal is to connect from here up into the uh, property to be, to be developed. And actually that's supposed to be Southwest Durham Drive. But what, what struck me about that is I've been living there a long time. I went through the collector street plan meetings 
and there was a lot of support for here's George King Road over here. There was a lot of support for connecting here using this as the collector street. But we were told time and time again by the lead planner and other planners, you cannot pave a road through George King. Uh, through, on George King, you cannot pave George King through Corps of Engineer land. Okay, so now I'm wondering, how are they going to pave a road through Corps of Engineer land? And uh, and and I caught the uh, I've been emailing back and forth with the lead planner on this, and I was sent by them to another planner who has more expertise in roadway. And they informed me of uh, some interesting things uh, in their last email, uh, second to last email about this. How are they going to pave that? Say, nor, nor have I researched this extent, issue extensively. Oh, well, you need to get it right away from the Corps of Engineers to do this. And he says, I've not researched this issue extensively regarding the right of way. Therefore, I cannot verify that the right of way still exists today. I previously verbally advised the applicant's engineer of this issue. By committing to make the connection as currently illustrated, that is this Crossland Drive connection, the applicant will be required to obtain right of way and or construction easements from the Corps as needed to make this roadway connection. So they need to get right away from the Corps of Engineers to do this. Uh, uh, alternatively, if they later determine this connection is longer, no longer feasible, a rezoning subject to determination subject to a determination by the planning director would be likely to be required to remove this requirement. So my concern is uh, this site has four access points. Two of them are at this north side, one here and one here, and two are on the south. One is this road. And that's going to happen. No one can stop that. That has to be done by the UDO. But this one, it's up in the air, as I said. And this one, planning has already said it can't be paved. So if they develop this, so the possibility exists that they could develop this and make a wonderful development. And then, who knows, next week there will be another plan for this huge 40 acres here and beyond. And it all comes into here. And they can't get in and out here. So where do they go? All the traffic would go right on our Celeste Serval. If, I mean, so they may build all these houses and they go to the planning director and say, well, we can't get approval from Corps of Engineers to have a right of way to build our road. And so they go to the planning director and say, we got this huge development. We need to get the approval to go through, you know, to, to get a home occupancy permit. They would have to get the, permission from the planning director and what do you suppose the planning director is going to do with all these taxable places and want to fill he's going to very possibly approve it and all this traffic from everywhere is going to go right down our little this is a local street they're supposed to build a collector street here this is a local street and it's not supposed to be so that's my one big caveat I would I don't like I said I'm modestly for this development I, I wouldn't want it to stop uh, I mean I'd like to see Lee Village develop but not going through my neighborhood, obviously through all. So maybe if I, I'd like to respectfully suggest, you know, that you could consider approving this development with a caveat that before it goes before the city council, they have to get uh, right away from uh, Corps of Engineers to build this road. This has to be, this road has to be done in, in, in my opinion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. Amy, did you have something you wanted to add? I'm just making myself available to oh. answer the questions you brought up. Okay. Thank you. We don't have anyone else signed up to speak, so we'll close the public hearing and bring it back before the commissioners if anyone wants to speak. Ms. Ward. All right. I have two questions, and Amy? I was wondering if you could explain to, um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Um, if you could explain to him what the process is so that if this committed element cannot be met, sure. what point in the process would it block? 
Sure. Um, when if this were approved as is today, the, um, prior to development, it would have to go through a site plan process. Through that process, prior to any, I don't want to say dirt being turned over because there are other things that could happen, but prior to development of, according to the development plan, um, a site plan would need to be approved. And at that time, the correct approvals through the Army Corps land would all be researched and flaked out. And if if it was deemed that the right-of-way was not buildable, the zoning, the development could not proceed. It would have to go back through the um, zoning process to remove that access point. All right. Thank you very much. All right. My next question is for uh, Mr. Edens. I received a, a call from a, a Durham resident earlier today who wanted me to inquire about um, your multifamily area over here in phase three. And he was concerned about the rail line running behind this, and he wanted to know what protection the people in those um, apartments, townhouses, whatever form they take, what protection would they have from the rail being, having the rail line right in their backyards? and how would they know <clears throat> that was coming? Uh, one, that probably wouldn't be determined until site plan because we haven't done very much detailed design at all. Um, I'm speaking for my client here to say that they're not in the business of building product that they can't sell, that people are not gonna be happy with when they move in. So the only assurance I can make is that we will make every possible effort at site plan to properly buffer uh, between the rail and those units so that there won't be any issues in the future. Thank you. Anyone else? Can we get a motion? Move that we approve zoning case Z1300014. No. To be moved and properly second, all those in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. Any opposition? Motion has passed 12 to 0. All right, thank you. Oh. Move down to public hearing 7B. No, thank you. The KO Creek Phase 2 initial, which is Z130034A. Good evening, I'm Scott Whiteman from the Planning Department. This case, a Call Creek Phase 2, is an initial zoning that's initiated by the City of Durham based on a voluntary annexation petition submitted by the, uh, a representative of the owner of the property. Uh, the proposal is to change the zoning, is to uh, establish a city zoning of RS20 on the subject lots. Currently they're zoned RR Rural Residential in Durham County. So the site is uh, near the intersection of Herndon Road and Scott King Road. The, the lots, as they are currently platted, are all smaller than would be permitted in the RR district. So the staff is recommending as part of the annexation that the uh, city council establish RS20 zoning so that all the lots would comply with the, all the minimum lot size was, would comply with zoning. They're currently, there's one house on the lot, so there's actually two, se two separate segments, one that consists of seven lots on Delaire Drive, another that consists of two lots on Herndon Road. They're all part of the same annexation and zoning case. Uh, and then the staff does recommend, or does determine that this, cons this is consistent with the comprehensive plan and with the city policy for initial zoning of newly annexed land. I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you. We have one person signed up to speak, which is uh, Jared Edens for. No. Okay, we'll close the uh, public hearing and bring it back before the commissioners. Do we have anyone else wishing to speak? No? All right, can we get a motion? <clears throat> Mr. Chair, 
move approval of Z1300034A. Second. All right. Been moved and properly second. All those in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. Any opposition? Motion has passed 12 to 0. All right. Thank you. So we'll, we'll move down to 9B. Any announcements? What do we have for next month? Mr. Chair, we have two zoning cases and uh, the introduction of the downtown open space plan next, scheduled for next month. All right. Thank you. Any other announcements? No? Okay. Well, all hearts and minds are clear. We'll adjourn.